CPAC with new energy, with new resolve, with new purpose, with a spring in my step. Yeah, I didn't think this was meant to happen when you get involved with Washington politics. You know, I'm, I'm coming away illusioned and enchanted with Washington politics. And what a contrast, I've got to tell you, what a contrast with the European Union that I flew away from a couple of days ago. Europe is in the grip of a prolonged winter, literally and figuratively, a winter of discontent. Everywhere you go, there are protests, there are people grumbling, there are people uh, blockading the streets, Greece is becoming ungovernable. France, every weekend, there's a demonstration against the latest proposals to raise the retirement age to 42 or whatever it is. <laughs> Belgium, where I mainly work, well, you know, Belgium was without a government for nearly two years, and it was working brilliantly. Every, every growth forecast was higher than the last one, but... Um, Tragically, Belgium now has a government again, and the first thing that's happened is we're back to a series of massive general strikes. I tell you, my friends, there's a lesson there about government somewhere. The, the wonderful thing about coming to this side of the Atlantic is the optimism, the energy, the drive, and you know, it's infectious. It carries away even the visitor. He breathes in the air, and he starts to be affected by it too. When I write about the politics, or I talk about the politics of the European Union, I am as cynical as the next world-weary Brit. But I come here, and I get carried away by the mood. You know, I was, like I always do in this town when I come here, I, I did the whole sort of Jimmy Stewart, you know, Mr. Smith goes to Washington thing. Yesterday I went to the, to the Lincoln Memorial, I went to the, the Jefferson Memorial, I went to the Washington Monument. Now that, that one confused me, because of course there isn't a picture of, uh, there isn't a statue of Washington there. In fact... The first time I went there, I assumed it was a monument to Bill Clinton. <laughs> and, but, you know, you get carried away, and I came away with a battle hymn of the Republic swelling in my mind. And even here, among fellow conservatives, the drive, you know, if this was a group, if this was the CPAC somewhere in the UK or in Europe, we would be grumpy, right? We, the world is not the way we conservatives would like it to be. Our values are derided and traduced. Our patriotism is mocked and scorned. Our treasuries are emptied and plundered. Our children are being expropriated. There are plenty of things to be angry about. And there's a real danger, as conservatives, that you just get angry, that you just get curmudgeonly. I find myself doing it sometimes. But the wonderful thing about the last couple of days at CPAC has been that you've been focused on how we get out of this mess, on the positives of where do we go, how do we get this right. And that is the most wonderful thing about American conservatism, and it's when we are optimistic that we win. That was the secret of Margaret Thatcher's success in my country, of Ronald Reagan's in yours. It was the ability to infuse their words with a little hint of warmth, a breath of optimism, a sense that the best was yet to come. Where does it come from? This extraordinary self-confidence that every visitor in your country notices, this incredible self-belief that is like a, like a force of nature, awesome and inexorable. An optimism and a confidence that took a dream of liberty and turned it into a functioning state. And then placed the flag of that state on the moon. That attracted tens of millions of people from every corner of the world to come here. And that liberated hundreds of millions more from the evils of fascism and communism. Where does it come from? Well, you know, American friends will sometimes say to me, it's in the culture. Well, yeah, okay, but where does that come from? Culture, my friends, is not some some disembodied entity that hangs numinously alongside the institutions of a country. Culture is a product of institutions. The success of this country, the energy, the optimism, the self-belief, all go back to the little secular miracle that happened in the old courthouse in Philadelphia nearly two and a half centuries ago. Your character comes from your institutions. There is perhaps no polity in the world so bound up in the nature of its political structures. And I tell you this, if you go down the road towards more government and more regulation and higher taxes, I don't know if you saw the Heritage 
uh, Foundation study the other day of how many people are now dependent on the federal government, either through welfare claims or through state employment or whatever. If you go down that road and you reverse the constitutional settlement envisioned by your founders, you see how quickly Americans will start behaving like French people. There's nothing in the soil. There's nothing in the water. There's no law of nature that makes this country the way it is. It comes from the institutions. Your founders understood this. Your founders understood this very clearly. They didn't think that there was some magical genetic property in the new world that would make people this way. They believed firmly that their republican system of government would have the same happy effects anywhere where it was tried. They didn't think that there was some peculiar, unique quality in the, uh, in the Rockies or in the Pacific or in the American sky. Actually, Jefferson did slightly eccentrically once write to a friend in France that our skies in the new world are always cloudless, so yours in the old are always cloudy, which, you know, look out of the window today and you'll see that either Jefferson was giving in to perhaps an understandable excess of patriotic exuberance or that we have clear evidence of massive climate change before there were any carbon emissions. I don't know, take your, take your pick out of those two. We still hold these truths. What a fantastic theme for this conference. And by the way, what a fantastic book. If there is anyone here who has not yet read Matthew Spaulding's book of that name, we still hold these truths, go and buy it, do yourselves a favor. It has been a long time since I sat down with a book with such a feeling of pleasant anticipation as when I was reading that wonderful prose. We still hold these truths. Well, you know, I brought along a little copy of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of these around. This one happens to be from the American Civil Rights Union. We still hold these truths. What they, we all know how it begins, right? Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. To see how unique that is, to see how the US polity is set apart from others, compare it with the alternatives. The European Union's equivalent of your Declaration of Independence is called the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, where your Declaration of Independence promises life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, the EU's equivalence guarantees our right to strike action, affordable housing, and free health care. Right? This is what I mean when I say that it's unique. Now, you may think that's, a, that's an unfair parallel to draw, right? How can I hold up this absurd EU document uh, and mention it in the same breath as Jefferson's sublime work here? Well, you know, it wasn't me who drew that parallel. The first guy to do it was the author of the European Constitution, the former French president, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. When they met in their constitutional convention in Brussels, he said, this is our Philadelphia moment. And he went on immodestly and preposterously to compare himself to your third president. Now, I mean, where, where do you begin to deconstruct that, uh, that analogy? How about here, actually? Here's a good place to start. Jefferson wasn't there. <laughs> He was, as one would have hoped the Giscard might have been aware, he was ambassador to Paris at the time. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't in Independence Hall. Look, to see what makes your constitution special, to see what makes your system special, look at the others. Your constitution, with all of the amendments, is 7,200 words long. The EU's equivalent, the Lisbon Treaty, is 78,000 words long. Yours deals with the big issues, the balance between federal and state institutions. The European Union busies itself with such uh, exact details as the, statement, uh, the status of uh, immigrants, the rights of disabled people, space exploration. It's no wonder that they didn't have any mention uh, of God in their constitution. Their presumption was such that it didn't leave any space for the Almighty. If they were going to set down these things forever. We still hold these truths. Yours, yours was ratified by specially convened assemblies in the 13 member states, or at least in 11 of the member states. As I understand it, Rhode Island and North Carolina were a little bit late in falling into line. Ours was rejected repeatedly in referendums by 53% of Irish people, by 62% of Dutch people, by 54% of French people, and then it was imposed anyway. That's the alternative and see how dangerously you are approaching it. You know, I was reading through this again, and I was thinking, as a member of the European Parliament, 
Jefferson's words, even more than Matt Spaulding's words, Jefferson's words apply so perfectly to my country's discontents. Over my lifetime, the United Kingdom has ceased to be a free and sovereign democracy. Our birthright has been ceded inch by inch to the European Union. How aptly we might apply these ringing phrases of Thomas Jefferson's to our own unhappy predicament. How these grievances apply what, to what Brussels is doing to us. He's combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, particularly with the wider community of free English-speaking democracies. For imposing taxes on us without our consent. Tobin tax is on the way in Europe. For abolishing the system of English laws. He's a, this is my favourite one. He's erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Sound familiar? <laughs> and then how about this one? Uh, a lot of people don't know this. A lot of people think I'm joking when I say this. You know, the European Parliament, of which I'm a member, meets in two places. Every fourth week, the whole Parliament shifts from Brussels to Strasbourg, not just the 736 members, but the interpreters, the committee clerks, the translators, the guy who advises your secretary about her pension rights, the whole circus, right? Twelve tons of papers shifting back and forth in a special fleet of trucks, all in order to propitiate the French. And you know what? Jefferson had something to say about that as well. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable and distant. I don't know how he did it. That is real, that is real prescience for you. But here's the thing, my friends. The freedoms that you enjoy, the way in which this country holds its rulers to account, the mechanisms that serve to keep the government under control and to remind your politicians that they are representatives and not rulers, they all go back to this document. Because your country was founded in a popular insurrection against a remote government, a certain DNA was encoded at that moment of conception, and it's still with us today. And the unique properties of American democracy, the term limits, the open primaries, the balanced budget rules, states' rights, the diffusion of power, the direct election of every public officer from the school board to the sheriff, all of those things are a working out of that Jeffersonian ideal that decision should be taken as closely as possible to the people. The tragedy of the European Union is that it was founded in the opposite imperative. Line one of Article one of the Treaty of Rome commits us to ever closer union. And from that basic categorical mistake come all of the tragedies that we see today, where our treasuries are empty, our credit is exhausted, our people discontented, our governments remote and discredited. Now I'm sure you can guess which way this argument is moving. If you repeat our mistakes, if you shift power from the 50 states to Washington, from the elected representative to the federal czar, from the citizen to the state, we know exactly what lies in store for you. I've been a member of the European Parliament for 12 years. I am living in your future or at least the future towards which your present leaders seem intent on taking you. And believe me, my friends, you are not going to enjoy it. I was asked on the radio recently, on a talk radio platform here, somebody, uh, a talk radio show, somebody said, what about this theory that Barack Obama was really born in Kenya? I said, no way. He was plainly born in Brussels. <laughs> you look at the reforms being undertaken by this administration, they're not a series of random initiatives that have just been lashed together accidentally. They amount to a comprehensive policy of Europeanization. European healthcare, European daycare, European college education, European nuclear disarmament, European carbon taxes, the whole package. And I tell you, when you adopt those things, you don't just become like any other country. You become less prosperous, less independent, less democratic and less free. We, we are at the end of the road that you have just set out along. We're screeching towards the cliff. 
and a couple of us, a very small number of us, uh, in the parliaments of Europe are trying desperately to jam the brakes on while there's still time. And you know what? We look up and what do we see in our rearview mirror? <laughs> we see you trying to overtake us, accelerating frantically in the direction uh, that we have been going in. My friends, there is still time to turn aside. The very first speech from this podium at the beginning of CPAC was from Jim DeMint. What a great man Jim DeMint is. <laughs> proud son of South Carolina, great American patriot, a man who I am proud to call my friend. And you know, he said something absolutely critical. He reminded us that there are a lot of elections coming up this year. There isn't just the one. And when I say there's time to turn aside, that time is almost upon us. We are months away from where the decision has to be taken. You know, I was looking again at this. There's a lot of good stuff in this constitution of yours. And you know what? It turns out that most of the reasons why you're in a mess are really not to do with the White House. It's the Congress that sets the budgets. It's the Congress that has presided over the debt. And if you want to turn aside, you have to change the majority on the congressional and senatorial benches so that you have a majority once again. And what kind of congressman do you want? Well, look, we, we've all got our perfect definition, right? We all agree that it's someone who wants to spend less, someone who wants to give powers back. I would summarize it like this. Every congressman should take his oath of office seriously. That's all you need. They stand up there and they promise to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. If they really mean that, that's enough for me. Now, that brings me on to something else. The greatness of a constitution like this is reflected in the people who serve under it. And the most vital commodity in politics is the humility to understand that you are not bigger than the government that you serve. Now you can see that lesson. You can find that lesson in bricks and mortar, not far from here. The last time I was in this town, I had the great pleasure of visiting Mount Vernon. And there, in the frugal stonework, in the modest vegetable patches, you descry the character of a man who, though he conceived no children, fathered a nation in the happiest possible circumstances. A man who understood that the greatest gift in politics is the renunciation of power. A man who always dreamed of going back, putting down the burdens of office, and leaving before power had done its corrupting work. The hero of your, uh, of your revolutionary founders, the hero of the American patriots, was the Roman general Cincinnatus, who of course turned down dictatorial powers in order to return to his plough. George Washington turned down an imperium that would have been beyond the imagination of Cincinnatus. As the sword was our last resort in the defence of our liberties, he told his countrymen, so let it be the first thing laid aside when those liberties are firmly established. And in that supreme act of modesty, he set the new republic on the happiest possible course. And at the other end of the country, again, in bricks and mortar, you can see the enduring legacy of your first president in the home of your 40th. Now, this is this is CPAC, so I'm guessing that a fair number of you will have been to visit Ronald Reagan's ranch outside Santa Barbara. If you haven't done that, if you haven't done that, my friends, I cannot recommend it too highly. You know, in my job as a politician, I've been inside a fair number of politicians' houses. And in almost all of them, there are little reminders of status. There are the photographs with the monarchs and the popes. There are the gifts from visiting statesmen. There are the inscribed books from famous people. In Ronald Reagan's ranch, there was no hint that this was the place where the leader of the free world was happiest, that this was the, the, the table from which he'd signed into law the greatest tax cut in American history, that this was the telephone from which he had phoned to console the families of fallen soldiers. 
And with every step that I took around that little modest farmhouse, that he'd made with his own hands, he'd made the fence with sawn off telegraph poles, he'd painted it himself. The only political sign in the whole place was that the, the shower head was shaped like the Liberty Bell. And with every step I took, I thought, this is what the founders dreamed of. The citizen president who can't wait to come back to the country and resume his life as a private citizen riding around on horseback. Now, Margaret Thatcher visited him once there. She loved it. She intuited immediately that the house reflected the character of its inhabitants. Gorbachev hated it. He just couldn't understand how someone in such a powerful position could live in such a Spartan place. There's that famous picture of the Russian leader with his cowboy hat on the wrong way around. <laughs> Ronald Reagan gave one interview from his ranch to a liberal journalist, a liberal magazine writer. And, of course, she, being a lefty, she couldn't understand how a Republican president was living in such a modest place. And she said, what's the attraction? And in that artless way he had, the Gipper indicated the surrounding highlands and he quoted Psalm 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. That is the perfect attribute of any successful leader, my friends, the modesty to understand that you are passing through institutions that are bigger than you are. You are. And you know what? I wish that every successor could say the same as Ronald Reagan. My friends, I'm, I'm speaking to you as a, as a patriotic British Conservative. I love my country. I'm never happier than when tramping around the countryside of England. And I admire the character of my fellow countrymen, morose and difficult and drunk, but brave and calm <laughs> and reliable in hard times and indignant at injustice. And I'm proud of the things that we've given the world. And the, things that, the thing that makes me most proud, our happiest export, our supreme contribution to the contentment of mankind, was the idea of representative government. The idea that laws should not be passed, nor taxes levied, except by our own elected representatives. And that idea reached its highest and most sublime form on this side of the Atlantic. That's our shared patrimony. That's our common inheritance of freedom, in whose name we have stood shoulder to shoulder against tyranny and we have made this world a happier place. And I have to say, that extraordinary heritage is being lost in the country where it was first adumbrated. Since I was born, my country has become less free, less independent, less democratic, because our birthright has been handed away to Eurocrats whom nobody elects. And I've made it my life's work to try and reverse that process, to try and take Britain out of this the false and synthetic alignment in Europe and to rejoin the wider Anglosphere and the community of free English-speaking nations. And I am inspired, as British patriots are, when we look over here, we, we used to think, you know, there is one place where English liberties are still valued. There's one place where they haven't allowed them to be taken from them as we have in the place where they were first proposed. So you can imagine how I feel now when I come here and I see this country repeating all our mistakes and I see the expansion of government and the erosion of representative rule and the rise of the state and I see you making all the same mistakes that have made us less free. I used to dream of re-importing, repatriating our revolution, bringing back to the place where they were first proposed these sublime ideas of small government and big citizen. The last time I was in the US, I was in California, in the, in the wine growing country. And as I was traveling around, I was struck by an irresistible political metaphor. The vines that were planted in California 
had come from the old world. And the varieties found fertile soil in the Californian hills, and they flourished. And then in the 19th century, there was a blight in Europe, a plague called phylloxera. And the ancestral vines were wiped out. And in order to renew viticulture in Europe, the wine growers had to come to California and take cuttings from the descendants back to the ancestral vineyards and get the whole industry on its feet again. I had dreamed of doing something similar, coming here to this secure vessel and repository of British freedom and taking back to the old country the freedoms that our fathers took for granted. You can imagine how they would have felt, those wine growers, if when they arrived in California, they found that the aphids had got there before them, that the egg was already on the leaf, that there was nothing to bring back, that the, the dream was finished. There is still time to turn aside. It doesn't have to be this way. You deserve better, my friends, and we expect better. Let me end, my friends, let me end with a heartfelt imprecation from a British conservative who loves his country to American conservatives who still believe in theirs. Honour the vision of your founders. Cleave to the most sublime constitution devised by human intelligence. Don't be the generation that cuts itself off from the wisdom of your fathers and disinherits your children. Never be afraid to speak to and for the soul of this nation, of which, by good fortune and God's grace, you are privileged to be part. God bless you, my friends. God bless America. And God bless the alliance of the free English-speaking nations. Thank you.